Um, so I'm Bill. I'm from uh, an agency called Imagine, uh, which is uh, headquartered up in Boston. We actually have a, an office down in um, South Florida as well, which is where my wife and I flew up from um, to be here with you. Much nicer weather here than we're getting down there right now, extremely hot and humid. Um, and I'm here to talk about selling bigger projects to bigger companies. Um, one thing I think is, is important uh, before I get started is, um, so I Imagine is a, is a decent size agency. We have uh, close to 50 employees now. Um, been in business um, for, I'd say, about 15 years. And this talk um, is not intended to, um, to necessarily be designed around building an agency, um, building a big company. I mean, maybe some people want to do that. Um, maybe some people just want to earn a better living, sell bigger projects. Uh, so it's really just about uh, making more money. Um, either making more money doing what you're already doing or doing bigger stuff. Um, I know that a lot of people get into this business it's not really for the money, uh, just a passion for either design or development or technology. And, um, you know, I can honestly say now after doing this for many years that it really shouldn't be all about the money. I, I wouldn't have ever thought I would say that um, if someone had asked me in my early 20s because back then, you know, it was all about building something big and making a bunch of money and, and having cool things. And, um, and now as I look back, um, you know, it's, it's really been about enjoying what I've done and a passion for this business. Um, for me personally, um, I'm, I'm not a web developer. It's another disclaimer. So all the stuff I'm going to talk about here today, if anybody has any questions about exactly how we do the stuff that we do, please, um, I probably won't be able to answer any of that stuff. I'm a sales and marketing guy. Um, but um, so sales and marketing has always been my passion. It's, it's what I was doing before I started Imagine. Um, and without that passion, there, there definitely wouldn't have been much success. So it, it really shouldn't be all about the money. But um, that said, I don't know many people that don't want to make more money. Um, if there's anyone in the room that doesn't care about making any more money, raise your hand. All right. So we all care about making more money. And it does, again, it doesn't necessarily mean making millions of dollars and building big companies, um, but just earning, um, earning more for yourself and, um, and being more profitable. And, uh, and, and ultimately, the way that we have found and imagined the way that we've done that is moving up the food chain. Um, to a certain extent, what I'm going to talk about here today is simply getting more for what you're already doing. Uh, but with us, it's definitely been a graduation. We've had to, we've had to move up. We've had to take chances and, and sell bigger projects and sell things that we weren't necessarily comfortable with or confident that we were going to be able to execute on. Um, so it's really a mix of simply charging more for what you're already good at and what you're already doing because most people that I meet are not charging enough. Um, but also, you know, like I said, moving up the food chain and, and, and figuring out how to sell bigger stuff. So I think um, probably important for me to start with a little bit of an intro um, on, on who I am, who my, who my company is. I don't want this to come across at all as a sales pitch about me, but just in order to establish a little bit of credibility here in what I'm going to be talking about, um, I'd want to talk a little bit about the history. So we started, like I said, I mean, if you really, if you really want to dig in, we, my partner and I, um, so companies owned by two of us, um, we, we started dabbling in web stuff as early as like 1995. So. Um, we're talking at a time where nobody had websites. So it was very easy to sell web development services because, uh, because everybody was hearing of this stuff. Everybody knew they needed something. Nobody had any clue um, how to get it done. And whatever you walked in and said to people, they were going to believe and, and buy it from you because everybody needed it. Um, so we were basically kind of the, the typical two guys in a garage. Um, we we did not have any money to put into this business. Um, and when I say we didn't have any money, I mean we had no money. We, my partner and I both um, grew up, I'd say, relatively poor, single moms. 
Um, so not even a couple thousand dollars to put into this business at the beginning. Um, we were just a couple guys with computers. Um, me with a little bit of sales and marketing. Maybe I pretended to be a designer for the first little while that we were starting out. My partner, a lot more technical than I am. He always handled the, the programming side of things. Um, but just uh, pretty much kind of the, I'd say a very typical model in this business, just a couple of guys diving in and figuring things out. Um, which 18, 15, 20 years later, uh, basically what we're still doing every day, just figuring it out. Um, in the early days, pretty much taking on anything that we could get. Um, so from very small business, little brochure websites, um, doing a little bit of e-commerce, uh, a mix, pretty much again, anything we could get our hands on just to figure stuff out, make a paycheck, whatever we sold, we would pretty much split, split the check and, and that's how we were making a living. Uh, we had zero focus. So neither my partner or I came from any real industry background, so it's not as though we came with any connections, it's not as though we had, came with any knowledge of any particular industry. Um, there was no focus. Anything we could sell, we would do in terms of web development. We uh, were so old that you know, there was no WordPress. There was, there was no Joomla, there was no Drupal. Um, there was nothing, so we, I say we, um, he, built our, our own proprietary CMS um, because there really was nothing else. So back then, we, we first started on Cold Fusion, um, eventually transitioned over to ASP, ASP.NET, um, did that for, for many years. We never really, we didn't want to be a software CMS company, that's never really what we wanted to be, but because there wasn't anything else good available to us, we had our own CMS. So it was great once the open source platforms um, really you know, kind of came into their own over the past several years. Um, we dabbled a little in Joomla, a little bit in Drupal, but ultimately, mm, I'd say three, four years ago, decided WordPress was what we're gonna focus on. So we've been um, solely focused on WordPress as our platform um, for the past uh, three to four years or so. Um, so again, going way back, average project was anywhere from a thousand to a few thousand dollars. Um, again, mostly, mostly small, small businesses. Uh, manufacturing was just an easy target for us um, because we just happened to have been located near a bunch of industrial parks that had a lot of manufacturers, small manufacturers, maybe companies that did anywhere between uh, three and ten million dollars a year in revenues. Um, so we focused a lot on them only because there were a lot of them around us. Uh, they all needed websites and they could all afford one, two, three thousand dollars for us to throw together a decent website for them. Um, what's very important and I think is, is, is going to show throughout this entire presentation is um, even back then we always were focused if not obsessed on sales and marketing. So we I guess we are technology people, um, more so some people in our company than others. I, I again, don't, I don't consider myself really a technical person. Um, but my partner and I both, in just kind of permeating throughout the company, we've always been obsessed with sales and marketing because it's my belief that without that mentality, uh, you will not grow a business very much. If you're focused just day to day on WordPress or on design or on development, um, you know, the saying, if you build it, they'll come. I don't think that's true at all. I wish that were true. I wish that we could have sat back, built a business, that people would have been flocking to us, um, looking to spend money. Uh, just never worked that way. We have always had to find and close business the hardest way possible, which I'm gonna talk about here today. And a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about, um, a lot of people might, ha might not have the stomach for. Um, you know, the sales and marketing that I'm gonna talk about is, is hard. Um, it's time consuming. It requires this, as I say, an obsession over sales and marketing um, and, and relentless pursuit of, of new business. And I'll get into the details of all that. Um, so the next decade, I would say after the first few years, we went about 10 years straight um, being one particular era of our business. And that's where we gradually defined what our strengths were. Um, again, that never stops. We're still defining our strengths every day and they change. Um, 
figured out what type of projects made money. So like I said, in the early days, we would take on anything and everything. Uh, we learned what was really gonna be our bread and butter. And I would say for the most part, it was what would be called a brochure site. Um, so a brochure site might not be a five or six page website for the pizza shop down the street. Even for a manufacturer or a small high tech startup, the sites are not tremendously complex. They might have 40, 50, 60 pages on them. They might have some functionality in WordPress to manage press releases and put registration forms in front of things like white papers and and maybe they're integrated with a CRM system like Salesforce.com or Marketo, but these are not any, most of what I'm gonna talk about here today through, through our entire evolution um, and, and all the selling I'm gonna talk about is not um, with regard to selling complex web applications. That's not who we are. We're a website design and digital marketing company. So none of the things I'm talking about are complex development. Um, we might have the technical acumen in house, but that's uh, the, the highly, highly technical projects have never been uh, what we consider to be money makers. Um, and there's a lot of money out there to be spent on the real technical stuff, but not necessarily to be made in terms of profitability. So we've always focused on the relatively simple type of stuff. Um, and that took a while to figure out. We built a few, we, we made a lot of mistakes. We built a few highly technical applications. We built a few e-commerce sites that, um, again, I'm going back a little bit, that maybe should have probably cost $50,000 and we charged eight, um, literally. And a year later, we're still, we're still building this website. Um, we, we made a lot of those mistakes. Um, so it was a very important thing for us to identify what type of projects were really money makers. Um, we started over this next, next decade to define our industries and the type of companies that, we're go, that, we, just, that we thought were going to be good to go after. And again, that's always evolving still today. Um, but as I'm going to point out, I think critical um, and I think a lot, of thi uh, a, a lot of developers that I meet are not doing this. Again, there's, um, it's very easy to take on anything and everything. Um, and try to be everything to everyone, I think that's a mistake. I think that everybody, um, whether you're one guy, five guys, um, or 50, um, you, know, you, you need to define um, who your core markets are, um, what you're gonna be good at, um, for a variety of reasons, and I'll, and I'll get into those. Um, so we started to define that tech, high tech became a specialty of ours just because we're from the Boston region and it's such a tech mecca. Again, we don't really come from technical backgrounds, but because of where we happen to be born, there, there were so, much, um, so many high-tech startups, biotechs um, in the region, so much venture capital up there that we decided to go after those companies. Um, it did very well for them for about 10 years. And, and like I said, that was a little intimidating for us because these are companies with millions of dollars in funding behind them um, and big shot CEOs that had come from big companies. Um, we decided to go after them anyway. It was very intimidating. But at one of the things I'm going to talk about here today more is going after things that you're not necessarily comfortable with. Um, and I think that's really one of the only ways to grow. If you stay within your comfort zone, you'll stay pretty much selling and charging the same that you are for, the, for projects. Um, so tech, biotech, those became big industries of ours. We slowly added a handful of employees, very difficult. I'm sure anybody here who has an employee or two or, or more or is thinking about hiring an employee um, can identify. It's very difficult. Payroll is very stressful. Um, once you get into things like medical insurance and 401ks, it's, it's very challenging to build a company. Um, and so taking on those, that, that handful of employees was, was definitely a uh, Risky and also big sacrifice because it essentially meant my partner and I not getting paid um, for months, you know, kind of taking what we needed to, to pay our rent and, and uh, pay our personal bills, but really not making any income over and above that in the interest of being able to hire our first part-time designer just out of college. Um, more interestingly, as I talk um, a lot here today about this obsession with sales and marketing. Our first employee was not a designer, was not a developer. Our first employee was a part-time inside salesperson. 
Um, so it was a young kid who would hammer the phones for us and find us leads. Um, so we've always had an obsession on the sales and marketing um, from day one. Our average project over that 10 year period grew um, from about 5,000 on average in our first few years um, to about 25,000 on average um, over that next decade. So that's going up to about, about 2010. Um, we had a period there where we just sold a ton of projects at about $25,000. And just so you know what, who, who the companies are at that price point, these were, again, these were not huge companies, um, but they were no longer the small, small manufacturers that we were finding in the industrial park in our early years. They were, um, they were a lot of, like I said, VC-backed, high-tech startups. Um, maybe companies, including manufacturers, industrial companies, professional services companies that maybe did up to uh, 20, 25 million a year in revenues, which, you know, in the scheme of things is not, not really a big company. Um, and that was, that was our target for a while. Um, and, and they, I'm not going to say it was easy selling a lot of them website services for $25,000, uh, but we probably did over that 10 year period, we probably did six, 700 websites um, to completion um, at that price point for, again, companies that are not enormous companies. Bigger at first than we were comfortable talking to, intimidating for us at first, going in and talking to big shot CEOs who had uh, Harvard MBAs and Wharton guys, uh, because that's not, I mean, one other note, neither my partner or I graduated from college. Um, so most of these people that we've been selling to our entire career have been much smarter than we are. Uh, so it's always been intimidating. So as much as I talk about boldly walking into bigger companies and selling them bigger things for more money, um, I, I can't lie, every single time that has been intimidating to me. Uh, to this day, this many years into this business, it's intimidating to me because I'm usually selling to people who, again, are a lot smarter, a lot more formally educated, um, and in a lot of ways a lot more sex successful um, than I am. Um, but it required that, I use the word confidence, I don't know if it was real confidence, I would say kind of phony confidence that I've had to put on um, that, that, has, uh, that has generated a lot of these deals. Um, once again, always throughout this history maintaining an obsession, a laser focus on sales and marketing. Yes? It's interesting, and I'm going to talk a lot about that. Um, and I would say, yes, we have um, we have augmented our lead generation with new tactics, and you know things like social media didn't exist um, 10, 15 years ago, and um, and and this inbound and content marketing. Um, so we've augmented, but a lot of it is a lot of what we did way back, which I'm going to talk about, is still exists today. Yes. Us, B2B, we have, I maybe should have pointed out, um, we have always been focused on B2B. Now, I think maybe the reason I don't highlight that is because I don't know that that matters, um, and I don't know that that, that um, should necessarily be advice for anybody because there's a lot of money to be made in B2C. Uh, we just never really thought we knew it well enough. Um, we do B2C, we do pharmaceutical companies in healthcare, we're working on some hospitals, that would be the extent of our B2C experience. Um, so yes, we've always had a focus on B2B, a lot of technology companies, manufacturers. Um, but I don't, that's not necessarily a recommendation from me. Um, so recent years, just now looking over these, and then I'm gonna wrap up with our history and I won't bore you too much with the story. Um, but over the past few years now, um, we've continued and will always continue to define and refine our markets, as I just mentioned, hospitals. That's a fairly new thing for us. It's a new market. We're working on a couple of them now, um, but that's a fairly new market for us. Uh, obviously, continue to add and refine your core offerings at all times. Um, we've built and leveraged a highly specialized portfolio. We can proudly say, again, because we're so old and have been doing this for so long, we have an enormous portfolio, but it's also very specialized. So it's not only big, but we were able to, by focusing on one thing, um, and I can't emphasize this enough, and not necessarily one thing, maybe it's three things, 
um, you start to build up a portfolio of work and references that are highly relevant to those people that you're going in and selling to, and that has been our strongest selling point. When we went into a small high-tech startup in Boston and we could show them, and I mean literally showed them, although we've always had a website, we would walk in um, with printed color glossy printout portfolios. I came from print and direct mail before I started Imagine, so I've always loved the power and impact of a, a hard printed colorful piece, and I still do today. Um, so we've always traveled around with print, printed color portfolios of our work. And we walk into a high-tech startup and we can show, we couldn't necessarily do, do all of this in one printed piece, but when we can show five, 600 websites we've done like yours, um, but even if that number was 20 or 30 or 8 to 10, um, you've got a big advantage over the other guys you're competing with. Um, so specialization was huge. Um, and so we've leveraged that. It's difficult when we go into a new market. Um, we don't have many hospitals under our belt, yet we see that as, as, a, as a highly lucrative market for us. So that's a little challenging anytime you go into a new one. But the more you can specialize and build that portfolio and leverage it later in sales, um, the more it's going to help you. As I mentioned already, we made WordPress our primary platform over the past few years. Uh, there's been challenges in that because we are, as I keep saying, moving up the food chain. Bigger companies are a little reluctant to WordPress um, in many cases. Not across the board, um, but I would say our experience has shown Drupal to be a little bit more favored, and I, and I think if I were we don't have all the answers as to why that is, and we don't have all the answers as to how to overcome that. Um, we're constantly working on that, but um, IT departments largely drive too many decisions um, in a lot of these big companies. So we see websites as typically owned by marketing, and in reality, behind the scenes, marketing doesn't own it as much as they'd like to or, or, or they should. Um, IT is easily, easily able to convince the executives at a company um, that they know what's best um, in terms of the platform for their website. And IT departments tend to favor Drupal. So we're constantly fighting that fight um, and doing, doing okay with it, but we still, we still lose a lot of deals to Drupal. I'd say Joomla has not be, have been that um, impactful to our sales, but we lose a lot of sales to Drupal. We go back and forth every year, Should do we need to be a Drupal shop too? Would that double our business? Um, and it might, but we also know that, as, as I've already said, we can't be everything to everyone. So specialization, not only in terms of the markets you focus on, but in terms of your strengths and your offerings, spe specialization, focusing on your strengths, being great at a couple of things instead of just good at everything. We look at a lot of our competitors and they list every CMS you could, you could list on their website. And some of you might do that. Um, we, we laugh when we see that because we know there's no way they can be good at all this stuff because we're, we're having a hard time being good at one. So how are they, and, and like we're almost 50 people and we're barely good at one um, in many ways. And we'll see a firm who, who might be much smaller than us, and they've got 12 different CMSs listed on their website. So we know they're probably lying, um, which, you know, to a certain extent, you have to in sales. But um, <laughs> um, so our average project now, and, and, you know, and I don't want to talk too much about the high numbers, um, but, you know, we're, I think it's, it's at least important to mention um, our average project today is somewhere between fifty and one hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. We do some projects. Um, I would say several projects that are much more than that a year. Um, some done projects close to a half a million dollars. Um, nothing bigger than that. Um, many a year in the one hundred fifty, two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollar range. But again, I don't want to focus too much on that um, because I don't. I don't think that's the, the real focus of, of this presentation as opposed to just a gradual moving up the food chain. So that's just kind of an overview um, and history of, of where we've come and how we've gotten there. Um, as I've said a couple times here, I think it's really important, and, and, and a lot of this is marketing 101 that some of you might be saying, well, duh, I know that. Um, but 
as, as obvious as some of this stuff is, uh, it's amazing to me how rarely you see it actually on display. Um, and so I'm going to talk a lot of stuff that is kind of basic marketing principles 101, um, but it's important to mention and, and talk about it in a little more detail. Um, and it is important to identify and decide who you are. And, and, and as I said in that brief history of us, that was probably the most important thing that we did. Uh, we decided on some markets that were going to make us money. We decided on the type of projects that we were good at and not good at. Um, and we went after those and did it relentlessly. And maybe would stray here and there, but I would say the focus, once we decided what that was, um, that we were pretty good at it and we stayed pretty focused even though we always experimented a little bit, we continue to experiment. I can't say, I can't say enough um, how important that, that focus is. Uh, also decide who you are. Um, what are you? Um, again, whether it's you individually as a web developer or if you've got a firm, um, what is your brand? What is the identity that you want prospective clients of yours or existing clients of yours to perceive you as? Um, and, you know, that's not easy. And that's a gradual process. You kind of gradually figure out who you are um, in business. Um, as I mentioned, determine what you're good at. Because, and, and that doesn't mean to not experiment and try things that you don't know yet, because you always have to do that in this business. It's basically how we all exist. We're always figuring out how to do the next thing. Um, but don't take on too much stuff that you know is going to be a loser just for the money. Uh, as I said, we've, we've done that. Um, even as we matured, we did it because we've been through a couple, um, I keep talking about how many years we've been in business, but through that, we've been through a couple of really difficult financial times. 9-11 um, happened shortly after we went into business and everything tanked for a good couple of years. 2008-2009 um, happened and everything tanked. And I don't know that we've really, we as a country, have fully rebounded from that yet. Um, so there's been times where that occasional project um, came, came up for us as an opportunity that we knew was going to be a loser for us and we took it on anyway. And every single time, we regretted it. Um, because we did, we did rebound later, we did get more of the kind of business that we wanted, and then we still had this horrible thing that we took on kind of out of desperation sitting over there, not done yet, losing money that we should have never taken on in the first place. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's easy to say, you know, don't be lured by the money, um, but, but really the more you can resist taking on the stuff that you know is going to be a loser, the better in the long run. Um, again, determine what makes you the most money. I can't say that I have an exact precise handle. I think we, I'd like to think my production manager um, at my company has a better handle than I do on it, but I can't say that I know exactly how much we make on every project. Um, but you do learn. You learn which types of things are good, which things are going to be more profitable, which things require the kind of effort that you just you know, don't think is the best use of your time and focus on those things. And again, choose your target industries, choose your target companies and company size. I'm going to talk about how to target them, um, but it's very important to choose them. Um, that's the part that I don't think I can answer for you here today. As I mentioned, we've, um, we've been focused on B2B um, that's, and, and healthcare. That, that's, um, those have been our core markets throughout our history. Uh, that does not at all mean that that's who, who you should focus on. So I'm not really going to try to talk much about who you should focus on. Um, like I said, in our early days, manufacturers were always a great target because, um, you, uh, yeah, up in Boston, we had a lot of high-tech companies around us, but there's barely a town in America that does not have dozens of five, 10, $15 million industrial manufacturing companies everywhere in all of these industrial buildings and warehouses and industrial parks. Um, and and it, obviously it makes, it makes sense for a number of reasons to start regionally. Um, we've expanded our business, now we're a national firm. And I do think that you should consider going outside of your region, especially, I think that was a big step for us as well. We had always focused on the Boston region because it was easy to get in the car and drive to, 
drive to these meetings. Um, and now I look and, and think about even if it was an enormous, wasn't necessarily an enormous project, but let's say it was we're, we're going to be something that was ten, twelve thousand dollars but it might have required me a $300 round trip flight to get there to try to pitch it, but I thought it was gonna be a real strong opportunity. Uh, worth the money. Never did it in the early days. We pretty much stuck to who we could drive to within 30, 40 minutes. Um, and as I look back today, I would have expanded regionally a little bit sooner in my career um, than I did because, I mean, it just opens up the opportunities endlessly. Um, there's challenges in that, and I can say, being here in the South, um, you guys have been um, one of our specific challenges because Southerners like to work with Southerners. Um, and being the Boston guys, trying to sell into a lot of the Southern states, uh, we hit a lot of resistance. So regional expansion has its nuances, um, and, and, and the South was one of those nuances for us that we were just never really successful here. Um, but but you'll find regions where people don't care. There's companies and people where they don't care where you're located. If you've got a strong differentiator for me and I'm convinced you're the best person to do this project for me, I don't care where you are. Um, this is a remote, now we visit our clients, but you don't even have to necessarily. This is obviously a highly virtual business. It's a technical field. There are a lot of projects that can be done without ever traveling to anybody. Um, we always find it worthwhile to get in front of our, our prospective clients, um, and then once we're actually starting a project to be in front of them, and they'll usually pay for that. They're not gonna pay for your sales pitch, but um, most companies, again, not just big companies, once they've selected you to, to do a project for them, um, and you just put in the contract that you'd like for them to pick up your travel and accommodations if they're out of state for you, 90% uh, of the time, they're going to see that as, as a non-issue, um, to pay for that extra of four or $500 for a flight and a hotel room for a night for you. Um, so regional expansion was something I, I definitely wish that we had done a little bit sooner. Um, I can't say this enough, obsess over sales and marketing. Um, and, but, but knowing, again, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about here today, and gun it once I get into the specific tactics, as I said, I don't think is necessarily for everybody. Um, but it's difficult. The, the B2B marketing, so regardless of what market you're going, at, um, you're going after, for us all, this is B2B marketing. Marketing a professional service to other businesses, it's difficult. It's very time consuming. Um, it requires relentless perseverance and patience um, and a little bit of luck. And we wish that luck would strike a lot more often than it does. My wife is sitting here in the front row with, with the camera on me. Um, she works at Imagine Business Development. And, um, and we have, I think we have a team of, between inside lead generation people and outside salespeople, a team of eight, eight or so. And, um, and she's one of the people on the inside that hammers the phone and email and LinkedIn and making connections with people and doing research and finding all these companies that we've identified that fit our target market um, and contacts all these companies every day. Um, we wish that luck, she wishes, believe me, every day, that luck would strike a lot more often than it does. On that day that I'm uh, calling or emailing a hundred companies that won every single day, um, I'm gonna be lucky enough to get them at that moment that they have a need for a project and they're happy to talk to me. It doesn't happen that way. So a little bit of luck happens um, and she loves when that happens and they love when that happens, but it really is about just the relentless perseverance and obsession over contacting these companies, which again, I'm gonna talk about um, in detail. So to move on to the tactical stuff, um, and as this gentleman asked a little while ago about our lead generation tactics, um, they've evolved, but we have stuck with and successfully very traditional methods. And you, any day you go on Twitter or LinkedIn and you read a lot of people who are B2B thought leaders um, about marketing and lead generation. Barely a day goes by where you won't see at least 10 posts that say outbound marketing is dead, cold calling is dead. Inbound marketing, inbound marketing. 
Um, I've always believed, and we believe this at Imagine, that the people who say outbound marketing is dead and cold calling is dead are just the people that don't want to do it. And inbound marketing has, has, has given people something to grab onto to say, oh no, I don't have to pick up that phone because now we have inbound marketing. You can do things like content marketing and social media and thought leadership and people are just gonna come to me with all their money to spend. Um, I, I don't meet many people who that's working that way for. Um, obviously, inbound marketing is a real thing. Uh, we do it, we love it when it works and I'm gonna talk about it. Um, but one of, one of the reasons, my family was, was in the retail business um, for several years, coming up from Boston, seafood's big up there, so my brother and my sister had um, seafood business, a couple of stores. And one of the things I always hated about retail was it's, it's such a passive business. You're standing there basically waiting for people to hopefully walk in your door. And maybe you could do some advertising, um, but you're basically standing and hoping that people come in your door. Um, I never wanted to be in that position when I decided to go in the business. That's why I've always liked the services business. In the services business, you can constantly be reaching out to the people that you want to do business with. Um, and that's how we've always done it. It's how we continue to do it today. Um, augmented by some inbound marketing, which is, which is great when it works. But what we do and always have done from the time again, from the time it was just Brett, my partner, and me, and our first employee being a part-time part -time kid right out of college, I think he was actually still in college, um, to hammer the phones for us, it has always been the hard, hard work that nobody really wants to do. Um, and, and I mean nobody wants to hit the phones every day. Uh, the bad news, from my perspective, and by the way, if any of you have found other ways to generate a lot of business, great for you. Um, and, and the advice that I'm giving with regard to the phones and the stuff that everyone hates to do, forget it. But we have not. Um, for us, it has always been the hardest ways to generate business are also the most successful ways. So um, pick your targets, okay? So, so like I said, we, we focused on manufacturers just because there happened to have been a lot of them around us. Um, they seemed to generally have the kind of money that, that we were looking for, which was maybe a few thousand dollars in the early days. Um, and so we, we focused on them and then we found them all. So, so what does that mean? For me, it was literally on a Sunday afternoon, I remember I was still living with my mom. I was in my early 20s and I had her take me for a ride around an industrial park and I was literally leaning out the window writing down all of these companies in industrial park. I couldn't afford a mailing list. Um, and even today, we barely buy any mailing list. We do most of our research ourselves on companies and contacts using LinkedIn um, and picking up the phone and asking who the appropriate contacts are. But uh, back then, I, I was driving around with my mom writing down a list of a bunch of companies. Um, none of this was from a textbook. I just really didn't know how else to go about this back then. So um, I wrote down a bunch of companies. This was a Sunday afternoon. The next morning, I picked up the phone, called every single company uh, that I had written down the day before and asked who would make decisions there with regard to your marketing or a website. Again, none of them had websites. This is going way back. Um, and oftentimes it might be a receptionist that answered the phone. The decision maker would in many cases be the owner of the company. Um, again, fairly small companies. Maybe occasionally there was a marketing manager that they would lead me to. Um, maybe occasionally I would get hung up on. but. Um, I would build that list, okay? And yeah, today we use a CRM system. Back then, um, I might not have even been using Excel. I might have been writing them down on a Word document. I might have been jotting them down in a notebook. I don't really remember, but at the very least, create your list, build your list of, of companies, build your list of contacts, use them, put them in a spreadsheet, use Outlook even to keep, to keep your, con whatever it is. Um, again, CRM systems are nice. Uh, but keeping a, a relatively small list of a few hundred companies is not that difficult, um, whatever format you decide to use. Um, but find the appropriate contacts. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I did read in my early days, because I was a big uh, proponent of direct mail, was that any marketing that you do to anybody, 
um, regardless of the creative, regardless of the message, regardless of the offer, the, the, the most important component to any marketing is the, is the accuracy of that list. Okay, so um, I can't emphasize enough how important that is because we obsess over it daily. So again, Crystal here, my wife, the rest of my marketing, sales marketing team, um, every day just spend relentless hours just finding those people. Um, so contacting them is a whole separate part of it, but finding out who they are and knowing accurately who it is you should be talking to. And in certain cases, that's gonna be multiple people in a given company, so the bigger you get, it's not just gonna be one person. Um, it could, in, in many cases, we're contacting the CEO slash owner of a company, a marketing manager. Uh, the bigger companies now have all these weird titles, so we can't just decide, okay, we need to go after that position because there are so many made-up titles in this world of you know, e-business, digital, evangelist, um, you know, every buzzword you can think of has come into people's titles, so we just kind of have to figure that out one by one. Build the list, contact as many people as you can within a given company. At a certain point, one of them is gonna to respond to you and say, stop calling her, she has nothing to do with this, I'm your person, talk to me, and by the way, I'm not interested. And then you just kind of back off for a while. Um, but until then, until you're told no, contact as many people as you can, do everything you can to try to ease that door open and get inside of it. Uh, and don't worry about being annoying. Hammer them and do anything you can to get in. Um, so the meticulous research is critical with regard to who you're contacting. Um, create high value offers, thank you. Um, things like, so we did this in our, in our very early days. I would say we're a little remiss in not doing as much of this these days. Um, but in our early days, what was very successful for us is we created a couple of educational workshops slash seminars. Um, SEO was a huge topic and it still is just as intriguing to people. And we're going back to right around 2000. SEO um, was as intriguing then, if not more, as it is to people today. Nobody has any idea how it works. They think it's some magic that goes on behind the scenes, websites and Google's algorithms and all that. It's always a topic that people want to hear about. So we, we created this one hour free educational workshop on SEO, okay? And this to the topic could be anything, anything that you can demonstrate expertise on that you think an audience might be interested in learning. So maybe it's, a, maybe it's a demo of WordPress or WordPress being applied in a certain way. Um, but we use this free educational seminar workshop as an offer that we would, we would call companies with and, and, and say, we want to come in and do this for you. It's a way to introduce ourselves. There will be no selling whatsoever that goes on in this workshop. Um, and there's not. We would have one slide at the end of it that said who we were and said, and we would walk away saying, and by the way, if you are interested in doing business with us and learning about our services, please let us know. Uh, but this is completely educational. We went around with that SEO workshop um, and must have done it for 150 companies in a year. It required a lot of running around and traveling and, and driving around and meeting a lot of people that were never gonna spend any money but it generated a lot of business. Um, so high value educational offers, I mean the easiest use of that, people create webinars, white papers, um, blog posts obviously. So there's a lot of ways to demonstrate thought leadership and educate people. Um, the workshop was, was, was great uh, because it, it gave you that chance to, to build rapport, to be face to face and get to know people. Um, so offers, free analyses, we also do, we, even today we still do a lot of free analyses and I don't mean, um, I don't mean automated reports that like we all get emailed to us sometimes telling us where we're ranked in search engines. We do a very comprehensive free analysis of somebody's website. So an actual person in our company will write uh, with screenshots, um, critique a website, we hand we hand over a very comprehensive color document that's about 30 pages. A lot of it is boilerplate. We've, we've really streamlined the process for doing this, uh, but it's a very impressive deliverable when we're handing a company a 30-page color document with screenshots of their website and things drawn all over it and some very intelligent commentary 
and as well as some automated reports on you know, some of the technical things that are wrong with their website from an SEO standpoint. Um, those types of offers go a long way and they've always been very important to our lead generation. Um, so try to think of, of, of some good offers that you, can, that you can interest some prospects with because it's, it's much better to be calling people with that type of stuff than just, hey, do you need a website? Um, or do you need web development services because we're good at it? Um, you'll generate a lot higher volume of, of interested responders with offers. Um, and coordinate your outreach in, in terms of extending those offers. So once you've defined your list, reach out to people. Email them. Mail to them. We still use direct mail. Call them relentlessly. Connect with them on social media. Uh, link them in. Engage with them on social media. A lot of times that's difficult. We wish social media would play a bigger role for us than it does, but um, we've just found our prospects and our clients aren't as present on social media as we wish they were, so the, the engaging of them um, is, is something we'd like to do, but they're just not ready to engage yet. So social, we, we post a lot on social media. We, we do a lot of uh, you know, articles and company culture type of stuff, but as far as engaging our prospects, they're just not quite ready for that, um, we've found. Um, and score and segment your leads. I don't want to go too much into this because this can be a, um, this can be a, whole, a whole seminar in itself. But when you're using this process that I'm talking about of, of defining contacts and reaching out to them and extending offers where it's not just all about hard sales calls, um, you really end up with a variety of responders to your offers. You end up with the people that we consider to be the luck ones, right? You're calling people and someone happens to need what you're selling today, okay? And, and those, are, those are these couple of people of, of the dozens or hundreds that you could potentially be calling or emailing. There's a couple that you happen to get very lucky with that need something today. Um, but most of those people that are going into the funnel end up in different categories. So you might end up with a couple of conversations. You might end up with a couple of people who are willing to take your offer, um, but most of them are gonna end up in these two categories, okay? They, they might engage you, they might say, hey, we appreciate your call, we appreciate your offer. We're not really doing anything for six months. Um, or I'd appreciate if you check back in with me in three months. Um, or I know I'm not doing anything for 12 months. We have no budget. We just let some people go. You hear a variety of answers. And it's important to classify these people. Again, whether it's in some fancy CRM system or you're just writing it down or keeping track of it in a spreadsheet, classify the people you're talking to and don't give up on them. Um, so, so we have made most of our money with these people, not the A-leads. The A-leads make up for a very, very small percentage of the responders to your marketing. So once somebody gives you even you know, an opening of a door to speak to them later, stay on them, call them, call them monthly, email them, do everything you can to stay in touch with them. As I'm talking about, nurturing is everything. Once you build these contexts of those B and C and even D leads, the people who say they're not interested, not interested just means they're not interested today. They might have just created a whole new website, um, they might already be working with some firm or a guy doing what they need. Um, that doesn't mean they're never going to be interested in what it is you have to offer, so don't rule them out. The people who tell you no, contact them again in six months, something might have changed. In our business, unfortunately for our clients, but fortunately for us, a lot of other people fail at the projects they took on, and you'll meet a lot of people who say, hey, when you called me a few months ago, I was engaged with someone else doing what I needed, and they're not even picking up their phone anymore. Um, can you rescue me and, and help me out with this thing? So we've gained a lot of business um, through the failure of others. Um, so nurture people, use social media, use things, create things like webinars, white papers, educate people. Um, relentlessly but tactfully pursue the people that you define as your critical prospects. Once you have a sales ready prospect, Try to get in front of everybody face to face. A lot of people, this is a virtual business, a lot of people like to do things today mostly over the phone or using um, maybe a go-to meeting or a WebEx to do the presentations. I'm a big proponent of getting face to face in front of people. There's nothing like face to face rapport. So do everything you can to get in front of somebody. 
um, ask a lot of questions, you know, do a lot more listening. This is again, sales 101. Do a lot more listening than you do talking. Um, ask questions that don't even pertain to the project. Let people know that you care about their business, you understand their business, um, and that you're there to help them, not just to sell them. Okay, so educating, empathizing, is always gonna close a heck of a lot more business uh, than pitching and selling. Um, and make sure everything you do and everything you show is killer. Your presentations should be beautiful. Your proposals should be as nicely designed as you do your websites. Um, graphics, every detail, your type that you're using. We, we do fancy color covers on our proposals. Um, beautiful documents. You want to make sure that every single contact point you have with a prospect is on point and makes you look super professional. So even if you're one person, look like a very professional business because that's what these people need in, or, in, in order to trust you. In order to trust you with their three, five, ten, forty thousand um, dollars. So always remember that every single thing that you, what, even your business cards, your business cards, thank you cards, leave behinds, um, everything must kind of convey the brand that you want to represent. The details matter. Um, why should they choose you? Be great at something. So um, I think we have a few things that we've defined as the things we're really good at. It might be one thing, it might be five things. Define what that is, be great at it, and be able to communicate that to your prospects, why you're great at it. Um, define certain differentiators that might not even be that different, okay? We, we sell one of our strengths, differentiators, is how much we're able to support our clients after the project's done, because we do have a support and maintenance team. Um, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't be much of a differentiator to say, hey, we'll be here for you after the project. It is a differentiator. Um, add value through additional services. So for us, we do SEO. We do social media, we build websites, we do, all, we do web hosting. We do all this stuff um, in, in addition to just building websites for people. Um, as I mentioned, convince them that you can support them for the long term. That's very important to businesses. They definitely want to believe that you're going to be a long-term partner for them and that you're not going to build this thing for them and then suddenly uh, you went off and got another full-time job and they're not answering their calls. Um, so very important. Make them like you, obviously. Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, you're a professional business, not just a web developer. So come across as one. Be professional. Be professional. Dress the part. Um, have your presentations and your proposals on point. Um, and make it sound like it's going to be very easy for them. So um, people sometimes relate these type of projects to like as, as painful as a root canal. Um, you need to make your clients or your prospective clients feel as though you're going to make it very easy for them and you're going to do all the hard stuff and heavy lifting. Um, and go big, okay? I'm going to wrap this up in a minute. Go bigger than what you're doing today. Um, whatever it is you've been comfortable selling, whatever type of project you've been comfortable doing, go a little bigger, starting right away. Try stuff that's out of your comfort zone. Take on a project that you know, that you're not going to totally fall on your face with, but try selling stuff that you've been a little uncomfortable with before. Um, and in addition to that, start just charging more. Okay, so even for the stuff that you're doing today, I recommend you leave here and charge, try on your next quote that you give out, just charge 30% more and see what happens. Okay, and do that over a series of, 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 of your next quotes and proposals and it will usually work. You might lose a couple. So a couple of people might be a little bit turned off for those people that are just focused on price. But if you can convince people that you're better and that you have value and that it's worth spending the extra money with you as opposed to going with the cheapest solution, you'll win more that will outweigh those few that are gonna be turned off by you being a little bit more expensive. It's all about conveying that value and why you're a little bit more money. Um, but every time we, every single time that we have increased our pricing, not just moved up the food chain in terms of bigger companies and bigger projects, but literally just increased our pricing. We had times where for the same level companies, the same exact project, we went from 
$5,000 and said, you know what, the next one we do, we're going to $12,000. And we won more projects that, than, than we lost over the next six months of doing that. Because it actually increased our credibility that we were a little bit more money. Um, I think I'm up in time, or do we have time for questions? Or? I, I want to say, as far as questions go, I could take a few here if we've got a few minutes, but I'm going to be hanging out outside the room for as long as uh, I've got five more minutes. Okay, so let me see if there's anything else I needed to get to. Um, no, I don't think so. So is there any questions? Yes? So we go back and forth between Salesforce.com and, and Sugar CRM. Salesforce.com is the, obviously by far the most popular CRM in the world. We use Sugar as well because it's open source, so we can tinker around with it a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, and it's free. Yes. Uh, so as you grew, uh, how did you manage the ups and downs regarding cash flow? You have a, uh, a banking relationship that helped make that a little bit easier to navigate? No. Um, <laughs> no, we've, yeah, we've never taken any, I could, I could, that's an interesting point. We've, um, we've never had any debt, so we've never taken out any loans. Um, it's been difficult. It's been very difficult managing the ups and downs. Um, and like I said, a lot of, through the downs, a lot of it was my partner and I sacrificing paychecks to keep people employed. But um, how we managed it was just um, a lot of sleepless nights. Um, and, uh, and a lot of chest pain. So I don't really have a great answer for that. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, you mentioned that you guys uh, sort of stay away from custom web applications. I'm curious, uh, you know a lot of times in the higher figure websites, clients also need web applications mm -hmm. and they need to create it in or whatever. What do you do when they say, oh yeah, we need all of this? Do you yeah. say, yeah, we haven't, we, we have probably not been as good at developing specific partners as we could be. Um, so in many cases, we just have to say, sorry, that's not our thing, and we lose the project because they do want everything done under one roof, which in many cases, we know our competitors are probably lying because we know that most of the firms like us can't do everything under one roof either well. Um, but in, in, in most cases, this, what's been great about the evolution of this industry, uh, take healthcare as an example. Reason why we never would go near a hospital 10 years ago is because they needed, they needed us to actually develop like their electronic medical records and patient portal systems, and we were never gonna get into that business. Well, now here we are 10 years ago where those systems are so mature where we can comfortably say, oh no, we don't do that. We're the website guys. We can, create, we can create for you the most compelling public marketing website you'll ever have, but we put a wall up there and don't touch that stuff. In most, most cases, they're fine with that. Um, and I would say the very honest, candid approach um, has been appreciated by so many clients that, so real quick story, this big, big hospital project out in Phoenix that we're working on right now, they came to us a year ago. They actually found us, um, so inbound marketing can work. Um, they, they found us and they needed us to build their website and a very complex custom application. We said, sorry, we can't, we'd love to work with you, we're going to have to turn this down. They came back to us, not exaggerating, begging us to do business with them, please. What do you mean you won't, what do you mean you can't do this? We really liked you guys and we said, we just don't do that thing. And they said, okay, please just do our website. So they, they really loved the honesty of saying, we can't do that. We want to focus on the good stuff, the stuff we're good at. Yes? So if you're not uh, building sort of more complex functionality, that's, uh, how do you move from like a five-figure website to something that's like a $50,000? Bigger companies. Um, SEO, uh, that's Those are all additional um, services of ours. Um, so it's really just been, I mean, we literally, um, again, I probably limited on time here. I mean, this is, a, this is a very interesting story, and it's an extreme one. But when I say just comp bigger companies and perception, we had a technology company. They're in the healthcare IT field up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, so we started talking to them a couple years ago, and they needed a website. Nothing, granted, it's a complex website. It's a thousand page website, and they have a ton of content. So, the, so from a WordPress perspective, there's a lot of 
filtering of case studies and white papers and all that, but this is not real complex application development. Um, they had a pretty big website. We gave them a proposal for $150,000, okay? They liked us so much, the people did, the contacts that we had there, that my guy called me directly and he said, Bill, it's not gonna be enough. You're not gonna get this deal. And, and we would have made plenty of money on that deal. I said, okay, well, okay, let me go back. I literally went back to my proposal, opened up Word, changed the document from $150,000 to $200,000. I did not change anything else in the proposal. I delivered it, he called me again, he said, Bill, this isn't gonna be enough. You're not gonna get this deal. We ended up at close to $400,000 on this exact project that I had priced at $150,000. So it's not about what you're doing for people, it's about talking to the right companies. Now again, this is an extreme example, this is a big company, close to a billion dollars in the high tech field, but it's perception. They felt it should cost that much. So we got it. Yeah. Yeah, we don't get a lot of that. We were very lucky that we had him. <laughs> Ma'am, you gotta raise your hand in the back. Um, politely, um, but we do it a lot. Um, we just, we don't, we, at, at one point in time, we used to refer um, to maybe some other firms. Um, that was too risky, that could tarnish our brand if we referred them to someone. We just simply say, you know, we start here, and you know, we wish we could help you, but we just can't, and um, again, most people will appreciate that honesty, you know. It's not easy though, you do feel bad saying that. Yeah, exactly. Yes, sir. So on, on some of the more high price sites, is it essentially volume is really a key driver, or is it architecture? Uh, it differentiates $5,000, $5,000, 100 page site yep. from a $50,000. So I'll say sometimes it's size of site, just like a 50 page site versus an 800 page site. Sometimes it's functionality. Um, some very specific cool things that we're going to have to build in for them that require a lot of custom programming. And sometimes, again, it's just perception of the company. We have a pharmaceutical company we're working with right now. Again, I hate to throw out these ridiculous figures because it sounds a little like I'm bragging. These are 20 page websites for their, for their drugs. They have two drugs. And they felt that that's supposed to cost $250,000 because they're a drug company. Could, we could have done them for $20,000. So it's crazy how just perception of a company and what something could cost when you're talking to the right companies, it can be really crazy you know, how much that impacts the pricing. Um, I'll be outside the room here. It'd probably be easier, to, I think at this point I'm being rushed up. <laughs> Yep. Where you just tell them how much is this, how much you're going to make off this drug. Right. If, you, if they're going to make twenty million dollars off of that drug, then you can just say, well, we'll just take you know, we'll take five percent or one percent. Yeah. Of and that's a certain amount of money. <laughs> do you ever, do you ever use that approach or? We haven't. We used to tr do a little bit of customer lifetime value analysis and right. how many you'll need to get. Yeah, they still, we realized that that argument, they still would say, okay, well, that's all nice. We realize how we're gonna make from this, uh, but you're $20,000, the other guy's 12, why? You know, so it really didn't matter how much we could convince them they'd get, if they were convinced someone else could get that for them as well. You know, so it was really mostly about selling the value of us as opposed to what they were gonna get out of it, if that makes sense? Yeah. All right. Bill said he's gonna be outside, anybody? Yes. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.